Cool. Well, <laughs> you're all lighting up the chat. I definitely invite you to continue this throughout our discussion. I, I, I love the connections that get made in these conversations. So please don't hesitate to share your points of view as we cover our topic today. And then also um, any questions that you might have, because we can you know, stop and engage along the way. Um, so I'm going to kick things off quickly. I'm Sarah Sheehan, co-founder of Bravely. For those of you that don't know me or Bravely, we are a platform that connects people to coaching in the moments that they need it throughout their employee experience. What's different about us is that we are turning the traditional model of coaching on its head. Um, and what I mean by that is that we typically go population wide. So our mission at Bravely is to provide equitable access to a resource that historically has, has only been available um, to people at the top who are often not diverse. Um, and we have clients like Pinterest, the New York Times, Zillow Group, Autodesk, uh, all of whom offer Bravely to each and every one of their employees. Um, and we, in those coaching sessions, uh, collect and deliver anonymized data points to our clients and customers. I normally don't talk about that, but it's very much related and relevant to what we're gonna discuss today. Um, so excited to share more about what we do like throughout today's conversation. I think we have more of an opportunity today to talk about Bravely than we normally do. Um, and that's because I am joined today by one of our, the members of our team, um, who is our people scientist here at Bravely. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about Ludmilla's background in a second, but we're here today to talk about the science of thriving at work. And it wasn't until Ludmila, um, Ludmila Kofta Warpal, um, joined Bravely. It wasn't until Ludmila's work uh, began that, that we really started to understand our future approach at Bravely. Um, and Ludmila has an incredible background. So she has a PhD in psychology and a background in academic research on behavior change as it relates to health. So a lot of her work was around health and health care, but specifically she was interested in how to achieve positive health outcomes considering differences in people's needs and behaviors across diverse populations. Um, and so she's also an ICF certified coach. So as you can imagine, the combination of all of these things made her a dream fit in terms of the kind of people that we want working at Bravely. Um, and, you know, as we think about supporting the needs of employees at Bravely, we always want to lean into how we can further inclusion and belonging at the organizations we work with. And Ludmila shares that passion with us, um, but I would say like with a scientific bend. Um, so Ludmila, I'm gonna just pass it over to you to say hello before we start the conversation. And hopefully I did a, a decent job of describing yes. your background. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for this kind introduction and hello everyone. I am thrilled to be able to, to talk to you today. Um, I, I want to just add that it really it's, it's been an auspicious um, event for me to see this job, job posting and apply for it because there is a lot of overlap between what I had been doing and what Bradley is doing. Um, and I'm especially thrilled to be able to share my passion for science and, and passion for coaching at the same time, doing uh, what I do is bravely. Amazing. So one of the things, um, I think we were already sort of following this approach to coaching, like through the lens of, of what we call needs. And, and we're going to talk a lot about this today. Um, but today we're going to focus on the needs framework that Ludmila, as our people scientist, has developed. And our hope today is to shift the way that people practitioners like you approach employee support and development by looking at it from an individual needs perspective 
versus what we've historically focused on, which is competencies. You know, we've, we've often like crammed a set of competencies onto or, or tried to get people to fit into um, the square box that we've identified. Um, and I think through Ludmila's work, um, you know, we've really started to crystallize this individualized approach, this needs-based approach. And you don't have to be a customer of Bravely to benefit from this, which is why I'm so excited about this conversation, because everything that we're going to discuss will be practical and hopefully helpful and applicable to you as you think about your go forward people strategy. So to kick things off, I think to level set, like we all, again, we've talked about this numerous times the last few years, how it's transformed the workplace and in particular, the way that organizations think about supporting their people. It had like it, it was, you know, completely transformed overnight. Um, and at Bravely, we've held tens of thousands of sessions throughout this, what I would call turbulent period um, and collected an enormous amount of data uh, and gleaned incredible insights that we've, we've shared, right? And what emerged and I think led us to rethink our approach or how we present it to employee support um, is that it all comes down to needs. Um, I've talked a lot about it in terms of individualized support, um, but what I want Ludmila to start off today with is sharing with us what led you through like all of your um, research or review of research to needs and what science tells us about needs. Yes. So um, Bravely's interest in employee needs actually predates me, as you as you um, pointed out, predates me as a people scientist at Bravely. When I came on board, there had already been awareness at Bravely that uh, Bravely should focus more on employee needs because it already offered needs based coaching. And uh, this approach is very different from traditional coaching. So when I joined, I was asked to explore and develop this focus on employee needs. And one way I went about it was um, to explore why employee needs are important. They are clearly important to individuals, but are they important to organizations? And what does science tell us about this connection between employee needs and uh, organizational priorities? And um, these organizational priorities, as we all know, have recently changed. It, the last, in the last few years, organizations have been facing all the challenges that we know related to COVID and, and strong, stronger than ever emphasis on diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. So to meet the demands and expectations of this new workplace reality, organizations want to focus more than ever on priorities related to employees, such as engagement, performance, and retention. And both research and practice show that these priorities are tied to employee needs. So organizations must have the ability to understand the, um, the needs of their people, including the historically marginalized populations, and in, by knowing the needs, come up with appropriate solutions that uh, can be designed and provided. And what now, what research tells us about this relationship between employee needs and engagement and performance is really interesting. There are, it turns out, two mechanisms by which needs affect how employees function at work. One is that experiences at work that meet employee needs drive engagement via a positive emotional state that is energizing and results in positive pro-organization work-oriented behaviors. And these behaviors lead to improved work performance. On the other hand, unmet needs are blockers to employee engagement and performance. And it is well established in science that our mental resources dedicated to information processing, decision-making, willpower, 
are limited and unmet needs take up a lot of these resources. So um, th they are experienced as scarcity and put us in a scarcity mindset, which directs our quote unquote brain power toward needs fulfillment. In this way, unmet needs compete very successfully for internal resources, which could be used toward full engagement and, and uh, optimal performance and work, at work. And so these are the two mechanisms, uh, the positive one and the negative one by which needs are tied to employee engagement, performance, and eventually retention. Got it. So I think this is like a huge shift. I've said this already in like how companies think about, I think some have like jumped to the call and others have jumped and then taken a step back again because the pandemic was like required a, a different approach and some have maintained that and others have not, right? Why do you think that this is, like everything that you just talked about resonates, but when we think about the future of work that we all um, mm -hmm. are focused on, like why do you think focusing on needs is, I mean, you could even just answer like, what's the number one reason or like, why is this so important? Well, it, it is important because the way that needs are related to this employee-centered phenomena makes employee needs uh, what we can, we can call the prime target for interventions aimed at the improvement of employee-centered organizational priorities. Uh -huh. That's the reason why employee needs are so critical. They inform people's strategy for improving engagement performance and, and eventually retention. Mm -hmm. So this is not about business outcomes versus employee needs. This is about achieving business outcomes in a smarter way through employee-centered organizational priorities, which as we already know, improve as a result of focusing on employee needs. Got it. And um, this, this focus actually on needs calls for a very different approach than the traditional focus on competencies. It, it calls for a more responsive approach um, or intervention, something that we call a just-in-time or on-demand intervention. Yeah. So let's talk about this. Like, again, going back to the beginning of this conversation, we were saying that it's needs versus the new way is needs versus the old way of competencies. So talk more about the difference and why this way is more powerful than the competencies, because I yeah. think a lot of us are still investing in learning or other programs that are devised or designed to train everyone on, on what the company is pushing down as like the five or six competencies that are needed to be successful. Yeah. Yes, but Bravely has always offered needs-based coaching delivered when needed, where needed. And this needs-based coaching model is focused on meeting the needs of the coaches as they arise. So it is on demand in the moment. We also call it just in time. Mm -hmm. And just-in-time interventions, we know from science in general, are known to be much more effective than traditional interventions, which are far removed in time from the situations in which they are supposed to be helpful. So example, a, a professional attends a training about interpersonal skills. Then two weeks later, there is an interpersonal issue at work. By then, most of the knowledge is forgotten and the part that remains is actually hard to retrieve because knowledge retrieval is difficult in, in complicated and stressful situations. Again, because our mental capacity is limited. But a just-in-time intervention delivers help just when it's needed. So this approach applied to coaching is, is very, very different from the traditional more formulatic or, or prescriptive coaching, which focuses on competences as the, as the way to drive business outcomes, but is not based on needs fulfillment at all. 
it does not assess needs, does not represent employee needs, and does not meet organizational challenge to understand employee needs. Mm -hmm. And um, actually, Bravely's needs-based coaching made Bravely uniquely positioned to pursue the overall approach that is very different from the competencies-first approach and can be called a needs-first approach. And initially, Bradley did not have the comprehensive knowledge of a good or, or a good frame of reference for employee needs. And the missing piece was to create such a framework. You did it. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's like, as you talk about this and, and we are talking about it through the lens of, of what we do here, but I also think that there's like other mechanisms like a a manager could serve as the conduit to meet the needs of their employees, right? If they're the coach or if they're creating a culture that's really focused on the individuals and figuring out like what they need. What you're speaking to, the power of coaching in the moment. So even different from, you know, you're being assigned an executive coach, which in the past is like, yes. you're doing a terrible job. Here's a coach. Mm -hmm. um, and you need to work on your communication style or your leadership style. I think what's emerged and is almost surprising is me as the founder of Bravely, like in the last six years, 92% of people report that they learned a skill in one coaching session, which I think I would have been surprised if someone said like, this is what is going to become the norm six years ago. But when I think about it now, it makes perfect sense because you go in, you're a new manager as an example, you need to give feedback to someone tomorrow and you're worried about it. You're working with that coach to develop quickly what your approach is, sussing out maybe role-playing, figuring out like the, the, the sweet spot here for yourself. Um, so you're building that muscle, you're walking out of that session and exercising it. And now you have the muscle memory going forward. Right. And so, mm -hmm. and it was, it's clearly based on the needs of that individual. Um, you know, it could be something else for another person, like not having the confidence to, you know, advocate for themselves or present whatever it may be, but it's exactly what you're saying. Like we, as people leaders need to figure out what are the resources or how do we figure out how to provide that just in time? Again, it doesn't have to be through Bravely Coaching. It, it could be a cultural shift around, you know, building trust between managers and employees, but really normalizing that you are focused on individual needs rather than like these blanket competencies um, yeah. that historically we've just like put so much weight in. Or on. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, so I think it could be helpful for us to like illustrate <clears throat> what our framework is based on. So I'm going to share my screen <clears throat> really quickly and hopefully everyone can see it. Um, and so this is what our needs framework framework is is based on. Um, and Ludmila, I will pass it over to you to sort of talk through um, how you arrived here and, and really like what these two buckets mean and how it yeah. plays yeah. into how we think about needs. And again, I just want to drive home that, that we want you to take this and implement it into your work. However, that however you may do, be able to do that um, because it's, it's all relative. <coughs> yes. So what, what is interesting is that, um, that my research that resulted in this framework actually progressed in the exact opposite order to what it may look like on, on this diagram. These two needs that I called meta needs emerged from the needs below, the eight needs below them, and those in turn emerged from the lowest, most detailed level uh, of uh, 80 needs not shown here, gleaned from the data. So <clears throat> I call it a bottom-up approach, which I, would, I will describe in a moment. 
But to go back um, to the beginning, my as goal of my research uh, was to create a framework which identifies and organizes needs that people have in relation to their work, their career, and their workplace. And the goal of the framework in turn was to guide bravely services, assessments, and reporting to clients, but most of all to, <clears throat> to generate unprecedented value to clients. So um, Bravely's framework is based on Bravely's internal research. And to, to create it, I set up um, uh, some guidelines and then I, about which I will talk in a moment. And um, I conducted analysis of Bravely's rich qualitative data from coaching. You, Sarah, mentioned the thousands of, of sessions with notes, uh, what, what was articulated in the sessions aggregated. And uh, I also conducted a review of published scientific literature and added those findings to the results of, of the qualitative data. And the resulting hierarchical framework consists of four levels, two of which you can see here. And um, these two levels are, again, a result of interpreting and organizing 80 employee needs captured from the data. I did not add or remove anything arbitrarily from, from this original pool of needs discovered in the data. But how I organize this data upward by creating these two levels that you see here, this is Bravely's creative and proprietary achievement. If the two top meta needs um, in, that you see here Self-actualization is something you are familiar with, originally conceptualized by Abraham Maslow. It is in, it defined as a need for fulfillment of one's needs, uh, I'm sorry, of one's abilities, talents, and potential. And this need for self-actualization is more focused on the future and, and the present as it relates to the future. Current well-being, in turn, we also call it well-being at work, refers to current and recent positive and negative experiences related to work that contribute to the individual's sense of well-being. And this, um, this is focused more on the present experience. Uh, you see a tiny arrow here between these two buckets. What it means is that even though we do not rank the needs in the framework based on frequency or importance, it does appear that the unmet needs under current well-being may thwart needs fulfillment under self-actualization. So that's the, the arrow. And now how great we use this frame, we use this framework. Coaches have been asked and educated to pay special attention to employee needs, both in their coaching and how they report on the needs articulated during the coaching session. And um, I also designed assessments, both for coaches and employees, to, to capture the needs that employees uh, deem as important in their professional lives, but also to capture the needs discussed in coaching and to assess employee needs fulfillment at different points of employee journal, journeys through the coaching. Sorry, I had a coughing attack there um, and didn't know how to mute myself or get myself off camera. So um, I think this is really important because where we arrived here is based on these thousands of sessions that we had, right? And the mm -hmm. point that you just made, I'm not going to talk too much because I'm afraid that I'm going to start coughing again. But the, the point that you just made around the connection between current well-being and self-actualization I mean, I think we can all relate to this, right? When you are experiencing high levels of stress, maybe your workload is too high or you're burnt out. You definitely, if you feel like you're being treated unfairly, those impact the self-actualization bucket, which is really focused on all of those things that drive the outcomes from a business perspective that we are all gunning for through our people, right? Without our people, yeah. we're nothing. Um, and so it's important, again, I think we, pre-pandemic, pre-social unrest, like we left this right bucket 
it wasn't, I think, on par with the self-actualization bucket, right? And what we have found through tens of thousands of sessions is that they, the two go hand in hand and they cannot, you, you cannot focus on one and not the other. Uh, and I think that's, that's clearly, um, you know, where the, the guidance that we're giving to all of our clients. Um, and I think the, the, the shift that every company needs to make, would you agree with that? Yeah. 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 So, um, yeah, so the, this is this is very important to to emphasize that this framework will generate new data in addition to the insights that Bravely already shared with with clients. Yeah. And um, and how um, how it will help? It will provide different views that were not available before. In among them there will be what we call the, the static needs landscape, which shows what needs employees have and uh, to what degrees these needs are satisfied. The dynamic needs landscape that shows how needs are satisfied and, and uh, how they change across time. Then we will be able to offer intervention impact, bravely intervention impact, that shows how coaching affects needs fulfillment from pre to post intervention. Mm -hmm. And lastly, population segmentation insight will tell us and tell the clients how employee needs differ between the different segments of the employees defined by demographics or other variables. <clears throat> yeah. And um, the benefits of these data for organizations are, are many. First of all, they can monitor employee needs on an ongoing basis, both in terms of need satisfaction and any changes in, in needs, including new emerging needs or decreased occurrence of certain needs. So they can respond promptly right, to, to changes, move from a reactive mode to a proactive mode in order to, to continue to keep employees satisfied and engaged. And and prevent losses that could occur due to lack of knowledge and attention to employee needs. Also, um, importantly, needs data will tell organizations about the status of those needs which cannot be addressed directly or met directly by coaching because they are rooted in, in the system, in the systemic and organizational policies and regulations even organizational culture. And coaching can only be supportive here, but um, these needs call for, for an internal organizational intervention in, in, in addition to coaching. Some of these needs are fundamental, such as a need for fairness or a need for relief from stress and burnout. And ignoring these needs can cost organizations a lot, both in, in terms of profit and, and in terms of reputation. So all of the above contributes to, to the imp improvement of employee-related priorities and ultimately improvement of business outcomes. Yeah, I mean, we've seen this firsthand just in terms of like figuring out how you, I think this is something that you can implement even by creating your own survey questions, um, because at Bravely, we are providing data points back to our customers around things as, as deep as women who identify as this race feel less supported by their manager, just as an example of you know, identifying real needs within segments of your population. Like how do you figure out how to do that, I think is the work of the future because um, even within that group, like there is no, nobody has the same lived experience, right? But it's yeah. really starting to understand where you need to focus your efforts um, because the, the mandate from employees is, is very different now. Um, so how do you think a needs framework like this or approaching, again, this individual, things from this individualized perspective supports the DIB initiatives within an organization? Yeah, this is, this is a great question because um, actually one of my guidelines before um, I started creating the framework 
was that it must reflect intentional emphasis on the needs of marginalized populations. So in my qualitative analysis, um, I use data segmentation and dedicated keywords to, to give special attention to the needs of these um, historically marginalized populations among the employees, including those at the intersection of two or more marginalized groups, uh, groups such as women, racial ethnic minorities, um, LGBTQ um, groups. And the data um, now resulting from our new needs-based assessments also can be segmented to, to show how employee needs differ between the, the different segments of employees defined by demographics and, and other variables. And this way of looking at the data um, informs um, the organizations about the needs of their most vulnerable groups. And then they can use this information to respond to these needs by implementing high quality DRB programs, which are based on data and not based on partial data or, or good intentions or, or guesswork. It feels more and more to me like this is just like the, there's, there's no way to move forward without this approach. So what do you think the impact or consequence will be for not applying a needs or individualized approach to your yeah. people? I, I think that the consequences would be the opposite to the benefits of focusing on the needs. So those companies that do not focus on the needs of their people, will, will, first of all, they will not be aware what these needs are and how these needs change. And this means that they will, rem they will remain in a reactive mode, even to, to the point of putting out fires. They will not be able to respond promptly to changes in, in order to keep their employees happy and, and to, um, to, to uh, just um, make sure that, that um, they continue to perform. They may suffer losses. Uh, they may end up even dealing with low morale, disengagement, and underperformance among their employees. And <clears throat> they may even suffer damaged reputation as a good place to work. So because of all this, let's emphasize that this is not about focusing on needs at the expense of business outcomes. It's about driving business outcomes in, in the this, this smart way. So not just the top-down approach by telling people what to do, but also by giving them what they need so they, in turn, are motivated to give the company what the company needs. And then this is totally a win-win. That's it, what you just said. Um, that's everything. Uh, and I think I'm curious to hear from those listening if, if you feel like your company or that approach has, you've shifted to this approach or um, if you're trying to shift, like I'm always curious when you're hearing conversations like this, if you're shaking your head, acknowledging that this is what you already have in the works or you're struggling to get buy-in, um, would love to hear from anyone listening, whether or not this is already showing up in your workplace. Um, and there are a couple of questions in the chat, Ludmilla. Um, one of which is, does your research suggest the existence of a hierarchy of needs or more of a dynamic system of needs? Um, the, the grouping suggests the hierarchy in the sense that they are the most detailed at the bottom and then they become more general. Um, but we, we did not um, imply that, that um, there are differences in importance or, or frequency. Our research will show, will more, tell us more about the hierarchy. But the, the hierarchy so far is in the degree of detail. I'm just over here spooning honey into my mouth so that I don't have another coughing fit. 
Here we are everyone together live. Um, so another question about can individual employees of Bravely clients reach out on their own for coaching and support is needed or must it be approved initiated by manager? Great question, Alyssa. And uh, um, very much, I think, it, when you think about the, the needs-based approach, like we are rooted in this bottoms up approach to accessing coaching. So employees can um, meet with a coach whenever they want and it's actually confidential. Mm -hmm. So their manager um, and people team never know if they've actually engaged with it. Most people are pretty open to it, but um, Ludmilla, do you wanna add anything just about how this plays into the, the the hierarchy of needs or, or, or our approach to needs? Well, yeah, um, this, this is just um, almost a no-brainer that this should, this should be this way, right? That people have needs and, and can come to coaching when, when they need it, where they need it, and, and have it available. And, and then coaches respond to their needs capture the needs in the session and then report on, on what was what was addressed. So yeah. this, this is not to say that there's no place for competencies, for, for training on competencies, but it does say that, that needs should come first. Mm. There's another question, which is feeding into what you're saying. Diane saying, I understand about needs-based versus competency-based coaching, but I've always thought competencies define the expectations for people about certain behaviors that are required for their effectiveness. So I'm wondering what replaces that in your model. Um, and I'll just like quickly add, this is an area that Bradley's gonna be moving into soon, Diane. So you'll be, you'll be hearing from us um, about competencies and, and skills that we think people need to obviously acquire at work or power skills, right? Um, but I think Ludmila, you just kind of hit the nail on the head where it's about the prioritization. Mm -hmm. um, so skills and competencies are so important, um, but I think people also need to be involved in identifying what they need versus you know just sort of this blanket approach to everyone's um, got the same requirements. Do you agree with that? Yes, I agree. And and even with uh, providing this this uh, additional component of training uh, and skills and, and competencies, even even to this, the needs approach applies because everybody has different needs related to how they learn. And and if they can later after um, obtaining the knowledge about competencies and skills, can come to coach, coaching with, with their specific needs, how to apply these skills, how to better understand them. Then the, the um, knowledge transfer is, is um, incomparable to just traditional training on competencies. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, this is a great question. Um, and curious to, to hear how you'd answer this, Ludmilla. How do you create boundaries or create clear expectations around the types of needs that are appropriate to be addressed through a coaching or employment relationship versus those that can't be fixed by support at work? Thinking about performance man management specifically, my fear would be how do we keep the ability to set basic expectations, competency or otherwise, while still being empathetic to needs and helping someone succeed? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, so I think that, that um, there, there is a place for, for both expectations, appropriate expectations, and um, fulfilling the needs. Coaching is meant to, to meet the needs, but then the employee comes back and, and has to function within the organizational structure and, and um, address those expectations that are placed upon them. Mm -hmm. They can bring these expectations to coaching. And like for a great example is um, a performance evaluation that employees go through. They often come to coaching specifically asking 
to, to help them with self-evaluation, to help them highlight their, how they meet expectations at work when they talk to the manager. So it's really, it's really complementary. Yeah. Angela, I think this is one of the biggest questions, honestly, we get around, I always, I give a talk around um, cultures of compassion. And whenever like I say the word compassion, I'm sorry that I keep doing weird things like putting cough drops in my mouth. Um, I feel like everybody's like tentacles like get activated and they're like, wait, what? If we're too compassionate, you know, then are we going to be able to drive performance or, mm -hmm. and so I completely appreciate the, um, the question because I think it's a natural question. Um, but I do believe that we can no longer not do these things. Like we, we can no longer not support people's needs. Even if that's, you know, for me, I'll just give you examples. Like parents on my team, you know, 20 years ago, 15 years ago in the workplace, everybody kind of like had to hide the fact that their lives were hectic and crazy. And it was really difficult to manage it all. I want every person on my team sharing with me what their personal challenges are around parenting. I'm a parent. I understand people that aren't parents. I want to know what is it that's weighing heavy on you that could impact how you're showing up at work. How we manage those boundaries, as you said, is really important, but this blanket approach to like everybody is going to get the same level of support all the time. I don't think it's realistic. I know that you know, there have been moments in my career when mm -hmm. I didn't need any support. And then others where I needed more than other people on my team at that moment. And it, I don't see that as like unfair treatment or, or it's not unfair treatment. I'm sorry, I take that back. Inequitable in terms of the support, but that's a, that's a hard thing for us to put into practice inside organizations. Um, and I understand like why it's challenging, but I do think like starting with things like, like this needs framework is, is the first step in creating these more compassionate cultures. Mm -hmm. um, I always love the comments and, and conversations that we have um, that, that stem from the chat. Um, but it's, um, I, I personally always learn so much. And I think that, um, like we're all also sitting inside different companies, different cultures, different leadership. And so um, it's it's important for us to, to understand and recognize that. Um, somebody said, Jeff, love that, Sarah. I work in a culture of compassion. And honestly, I work much harder with a smile on my face than any other environment. I wanna be more productive and profitable for my organization. Exactly. And that's exactly what Ludmilla was just saying. Like everything that she said today, like basically leads to your comment, Jeff, um, that when you approach your people in this way, that it leads mm -hmm. to greater business outcomes. Um, so I'm just reading the chats right now. Anecdotally, by taking intensive protective actions during times of crisis, <laughs> Engagement and loyalty extended far beyond the employee and extended into family. That's right. Um, usually in organizations, when a team member needs additional extra support, it translates to other team members as having to pick up their slack. A big reason why some shy away from compassion discussion. Completely agree with that, Donna. Which is why, and Ludmilla, I'd love to hear your perspective on this. I think it's like, it's, it's your approach to your culture that, you know, it's got to come from the top. But if you know, you're being really transparent around, it all sort of comes out of the wash. Like, obviously you've got to make sure that it doesn't get out of hand, right? But, yeah. you know, when you're thinking about individuals, it's, you know, that it, it comes around to where that, per, that, like, I'm going to feel it. And then the next person's going to feel it. And culturally, it's just built into the system. Yeah. Um, so is there a framework that we can utilize to combine the needs and competency coaching? Um, not at this point, but um, 
as as Sarah uh, mentioned, Bravely is moving into um, adding learning training right to to our services, and and this um, training will include competencies to meet the needs of employees. So in this way, we will be combining the needs framework with, um, with uh, some of this competencies approach uh, also. Yeah. I know I keep reading these, but I've got to read Morgan's because I'm, I'm snapping my fingers. Right competencies are there for performance practice expectations, but if you ignore the needs of your employees and minimize support when needed to perform the competencies, you will have lower morale, which leads to worse outcomes and turnover. Yeah. And this is like so straightforward and simple, but it's so hard to put into practice. And I, yeah. I never want to like minimize the challenge, especially in larger organizations. Like this is like, you know, we're asking for a lot, but it has to start somewhere. Um, and, and Maureen's saying we all learn differently and you have to individualize coaching to that person to support the implementation of competencies. So again, six years ago when we launched Bravely, I never would have thought about the need to offer, I didn't think about it this way, but what we, where we have arrived is that we offer at scale support development that feels very individualized because Ludmila and I are going to have completely different things that we want to work on or have different sets of circumstances that impact how we're showing up at work. But when we walk through the door of that coaching session, it feels tailored to us, right? And so I think the, the goal, the challenge right now is how do companies figure out how to offer resources like this um, that feel tailored to um, and individualized. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen one more time because I think this sort of illustrates exactly what we are talking about in the chat. And I'll quickly share it because I can't see the chat when I do. But Ludmila, do you wanna just voice over the model of employee needs fulfillment here as, as yeah. we wrap things up, because yes. I think it really beautifully illustrates everything that's yes. sliding so up. Yeah, you, yes, you are right. This, this, cap, this is all captured, all that we talked about is captured in what we call the Bravely model of needs fulfillment. And it basically shows that unmet needs lead to disengagement and underperformance, which get worse as needs continue to be unmet. And the opposite happens when, when needs are met. And we think again that it's best if needs related to well being are addressed first because they are focused more on the present and may block self actualization needs. But uh, overall, engagement and performance gradually improve, as we can see in this model, and employees can thrive. Yeah. And I think it's important just to remind everyone that the word needs is not necessarily um, associated with the, the well being side. Like, I think we think of needs and we're like, I don't have childcare or I'm going through a breakup. But, you know, on my team, needs are very much correlated to development. Am I giving people the opportunity to grow their skills? get to the next level, um, you know, become better uh, at their role, basically. Um, and so I think it's just important for us to remember that needs, it's both sides, it's well-being and it's development. Um, so I'm just looking here, Diana Gowan, people often clap sympathy and compassion as meaning one and the same and sympathy is really demeaning as in feeling sorry mm -hmm. for someone versus understanding challenges, needs. Yes, couldn't agree with you more. And we're not gonna solve everybody's problems, right? But if we're empathetic and we can offer flexibility um, or you know, some, some sort of solution uh, to help someone through a moment, I think that's where um, 
you know, we've gone through so much collectively, at least in this country, over the last couple of years. I mean, worldwide, the pandemic, right? But, um, you know, there's just, there's so much division. I think a lot of people feel a lot of anxiety because of, you know, the way everything just turned over so quickly. And now we're in this hybrid work environment. Some of us are fully virtual. Some of us are still in person, but there's a lack of connection that's happening um, that used to, I think we quite frankly took for granted. Um, and so it's, it's a new normal. And I think we're coming out the other side and it's the perfect time for everyone to start thinking about things from this perspective. Um, well, I'm so happy that I got to share Ludmila today with, with all of you because she's had such an impact on oh, our approach you. briefly, um, truly, and has just made me think, you know, something that, as you said, organically was happening, but there's science behind it that Ludmila has uh, brought to the forefront. And um, it's also just so important to work with people that share the same values as you uh, and really believe in the work in terms of driving towards the same outcomes around diversity, equity, inclusion, ultimately belonging, the big B word is what we're all striving for. Um, and, and I have a partner in that with you, Ludmilla. So thank you so much for sharing thank your you. today. Thank you for inviting me. Of course, and you'll, you'll hear more from Ludmilla in the future. Um, and if you have any questions about what we're doing at Bravely, always feel free to reach out. Here's your SHRM credit numbers and your HRCI credit numbers um, if you need them. We also, we're gonna shift to another slide, but I'll start talking about it now. We're gonna have a conversation in a couple of weeks with a gentleman by the name of Ben Serio. And he was an executive in people at Pinterest. And he's very passionate about how to construct uh, like your pitch to get buy-in to finance on the resources that you want. And I feel like this is what every people practitioner wants to talk about all the time. It's like, yeah, I want this, but how am I going to get the, the budget for it? So sign up for this conversation. Um, we'll post it on LinkedIn and other places too. Um, Georgia, do you want to go back to the codes? Um, but definitely, or put them in the chat, definitely sign up for that next webinar because I think it's going to be really relevant. He's going to talk about how he got um, big budget for Bravely um, and, and how he presented it to finance. Very different conversation than we're used to having. We're not talking about a culture of compassion. We're like, how do you get the money? Um, but it's going to be awesome. Um, thank you all. Love engaging in these conversations. Thank you again, Ludmila. Have a great thank rest you. of your week and stay well. My pleasure. Bye, everyone. Bye.